I wouldn't normally do a review of what we covered in the last class meeting, but I'm doing that just so you can see how similarly the capacitors that we're going to talk about are going to behave. Okay. So in our last class meeting, we talked about the concept of inductors and inductance, or I could define the voltage drop across my inductor like so, the current flowing through my inductor like so. We said that L um, had units of Henry's, which was a, now I'm drawing a blank, 90% sure volt seconds per ampere. I can check that real quick. Yep. Um, and we came up with multiple equations, right? So the first equation that we developed says that the voltage drop across an inductor VL of T was equal to L di by dt. And from this equation, we came up with two observations. First, Inductors in DC circuits behave like short circuits. And our second observation was that the current through an inductor cannot change abruptly. We then algebraically rearranged that first expression to come up with a relationship for current as a function of voltage, where that was one over L, the integral from T naught to T of VL of T prime DT prime plus IL at time T naught, multiplying the voltage and current together gave us our power relationship. So we had PL is equal to VL times IL, which we can express as L I DI by DT. And we came up with a energy storage relationship W is equal to one half L I squared. And then we talked about how we combine inductances. Inductors in series combine like resistors in series. And inductors in parallel combine like resistors in parallel. All right. So those are all of our inductor relationships. So now we're going to talk about capacitors. Okay. So I mentioned at the beginning of class on Wednesday that inductors and capacitors are electrical duels. So what that means is that everywhere we see I in one of our inductor equations, we can replace it with B. Everywhere we see V in one of our inductor equations, we replace it with I. And everywhere we see L, the inductance, we replace it with C. And we will have all of our capacitor equations. Now we are going to go through and derive them. We're not going to spend nearly as much time as we did on Wednesday, but you'll see that it's really just one set of equations you have to memorize. And then if you, if you understand the equations for inductance, 
as long as you swap everything, you have all of the equations for capacitance or vice versa. Okay. So, oops, too far. So now we'll talk about capacitors and capacitance. So much like we did, we're gonna talk about the physical attributes of capacitance. So the overwhelmingly most common form of a capacitor uh, that is found is the parallel plate capacitor. And much like the name suggests, it is formed by having two parallel plates, okay? So we have the top plate up here. We have the bottom plate down here. And then not always, but very often, we will have a material sandwiched between these plates. Where this is called our dielectric material. So when we talk about inductors, I said that the presence of the core material helped the inductor to be a more efficient energy storage advice. Um, the dielectric material does the exact same thing for a capacitor. Okay? So capacitors, just like inductors, are used in electrical circuits as a form of temporary energy storage. But it's actually a little bit easier to understand how capacitors act as energy storage elements more so than inductors, okay? So how capacitors work is they provide energy storage by separating charge, okay? So I want us to think about that a little bit. Let's say that we put, let me do this in a different color, not that pink. One unit of positive charge on our top plate it would attract one unit of negative charge on our bottom plate. So we have some amount of charge on our top plate and some amount of charge on our bottom plate. What happens when I try to put one more positive charge on the top plate? I can do it, but it requires some amount of energy to do so because those positive charges are gonna try to repel each other. So if I put another charge on the top plate, they're gonna orient themselves as far away from each other as they possibly can due to those repulsive forces. That second positive charge is going to attract another negative charge to the bottom plate. And as this process repeats, we're gonna see that it gets harder and harder or it requires more and more energy to move charge onto those plates because of the, repul the repulsive forces between those charges. So since it takes a bunch of energy to cram all that charge in, as soon as we take that energy away, all of the energy that is stored by forcing all those charges close together gets released, pushing the charges back out of the system. So that's how our energy storage mechanism works for a capacitor. Effectively speaking, if we have positive charge on a top plate, negative charge on a bottom plate, we are going to establish an electric field between those two plates. And that is the energy storage mechanism. And then as soon as we allow that energy to dissipate, we're going to see a current flow because positive charge will move off the top plate and negative charge will move off the bottom plate, releasing the stored energy back into whatever circuit is connected. Okay. All right, so we can relate the quantities of charge, capacitance, and voltage, because it's 
an applied voltage that is allowing us to move charge onto and off of these plates. Um, so our relationship is charge Q is equal to capacitance C multiplied by voltage V. And from that, we can see that our capacitance is simply the amount of charge on our plates divided by the voltage that's used to put the charge on those plates. This is similar to what we saw with inductors, where it was the amount of flux divided by the current causing the flux. Here, it's the amount of charge divided by the amount of voltage needed to move the charge onto the plates. The units of capacitance are obviously coulombs per voltage because charge is measured in coulombs, voltage is measured in volts. If we recall that a coulomb is nothing more than an amp second, we have amp seconds per volts, and we call this a farad. So I want you guys to notice something. Even the units are electrical duels. The units of inductance were volt seconds per ampere. The units of capacitance are amp seconds per volts. So we're swapping current and voltage even in the units for these two components. Okay. That's how closely related they are. All right, so let's get to our current voltage relationships. Okay. Actually, before we do that, I wanna talk about the schematic symbol, um, which is what I did last time. And I wanna make you guys aware that there are technically two different schematic symbols for capacitors and they have specific means. Okay. So the schematic symbol for a capacitor, and we'll start with the generic one. Is this. So we represent an inductor and an electrical schematic by a coil because an inductor is a coil. We represent a capacitor in an electrical schematic with parallel plates because the capacitor is formed by parallel plates. Okay. So we're going to have some magnitude of capacitance C measured in farads. If our voltage drop VC of T is across our plates like so, then our current IC of T will be flowing into the positive polarity terminal whenever our capacitor is absorbing power or energy. Um, so this is our schematic symbol for a generic capacitor. Now, in some applications, you will see this symbol used. One of the plates in our capacitor looks like it's curved. We're gonna have the same current voltage directions and all that kind of stuff here. This is what's known as an electrolytic or polarized capacitor. So for an electrolytic capacitor, it is extremely important that the negative polarity plate designated by the curved symbol is at a lower potential than the positive polarity plate. If you accidentally correct the, uh, connect the wrong polarity voltage to an electrolytic capacitor, it will burst, okay? Now you might not actually see it pop or anything like that. Usually they have a thin metal membrane on the top of them that has uh, kind of a 
cross on the top of it. And it allows, um, if you connect your electrolytic capacitor effectively backwards, those crosses allow the material to disperse that energy by deforming that top plate. So if you ever see, um, looks like a cylindrical canister inside of like a computer or an electronic device or anything like that, that's very likely a capacitor. Um, and then if you see that the top is domed over, that's because that capacitor is bad. It has burst because somebody made a poor connection somewhere, something got shorted out. Okay. You will see, YouTube videos and all of that kind of stuff use these two symbols interchangeably, but that should not be true, okay? Generic capacitors, like the ones that we are going to deal with in this class, and I mean that both in a theoretical and in a physical sense when we do lab experiments with them, the polarity of the voltage that we connect across them does not matter. In an electrolytic capacitor, it very, very much matters, okay? So, because I don't want you guys constantly breaking things, we are only going to use generic capacitors in this class. It cost me too much damn money. Yes. Is there any electrolytic? Absolutely. Um, so, electrolytic capacitors are used in a lot of power supplies, effectively to make sure that um, you get good voltage regulation and things like that. So, there are applications where electrolytic capacitors are very, very much needed. Uh, rectifiers and things like that. Nothing that we're gonna deal with in this class. So. Okay, so now that I've introduced that, let's talk about our relationships, okay? So, the current through a capacitor is, by definition, the change in the charge stored by the capacitor with respect to time. This is a relationship that we learned on the second day of class. Current is the derivative of charge with respect to time. Well, in a capacitor, we know that charge and voltage are related to each other by the capacitance. So from that, assuming that our capacitance is a constant value, we will have C dV by dt. And I'm gonna add this in gray. I don't expect you to write it down or anything, but obviously if we were taking the total derivative, um, we would also have V dc by dt. In this class, all of our capacitors are going to be constant, so their value isn't going to change as a function of time. So that term is going to go away. But because I was asked a question about the inductance relationship, I'm going to give it to you guys here for the capacitance relationship as well. Okay. So we have a simple rate of change or derivative-based relationship, just like we saw with inductors. And it's literally the exact same relationship, except that everywhere we had V, we now have I. Everywhere we had I, we now have V. And we've swapped all our uh, L's for C's. So without going into a huge amount of detail here, what do you think the two pieces of information that we can glean from this equation are? So let me go back to page one here. When we had inductors, we found by looking through this derivative-based relationship that inductors in DC circuits will behave like short circuits, right? So if the current doesn't change, our voltage was zero. If we look at our capacitor relationship, If the voltage doesn't change, what will our current be? Zero, right? So what is something that describes having zero current able to flow? An open circuit, right? 
So in a DC circuit, inductors behave like short circuits and capacitors behave like open circuits. What about our other inductor relationship, right? So not so that uh, so that I'm not flipping back and forth between the pages constantly. I'll just tell you guys what it was. So the other relationship that we gleaned from this mathematical relationship was that in a deep, excuse me, um, the current through an inductor cannot change abruptly because to do so would cause an infinite transfer of energy in an infinitesimal amount of time, right? We saw that by allowing our current to change slowly and then decreasing the time that we allowed the current to change until we got effectively infinite voltage spikes. Well, what would happen if the voltage drop across the capacitor changed abruptly? What does the math tell us? If the derivative of V divided by or the derivative of V with respect to time is effectively infinite because our voltage changes from one value to some different value in an instant. What is our current going to be? Infinity, right? So effectively, if we allow our voltage across our inductor to change, we are creating an infinite amount of charge, which cannot happen. So The voltage drop across a capacitor cannot change abruptly. If we algebraically rearrange our first relationship here, we can solve for the capacitor voltage in terms of the capacitor current. That's going to look like one over C multiplied by the integral from negative infinity to T of I, what the heck just happened there? C of T prime, DT prime, uh, or a more useful interpretation of this would be this guy, one over C times the integral from T naught, which is some point in time where we know what the capacitor's voltage is <clears throat> to T of IC T prime DT prime plus VC at T naught. So we can see from this expression that much like our inductors, Excuse me, our capacitors also exhibit some form of memory in as much as present values of the capacitor voltage depend on past values of the capacitor voltage. So this will be relationship two. Our power relationship. Will simply be the product. Of voltage and current. And we can substitute in relation one here. To find that we'll have C. V. DV by DT. And without going through the derivation, because it is literally the exact same thing as how we derived it with inductors on Wednesday, the energy stored by a capacitor 
will be one half C times the voltage squared. So these are our four relationships, or our four mathematical relationships. We also have two kind of statements that help us determine how capacitors behave. Uh, now let's talk about combining capacitance. So let me ask you guys a question. To this point, everything about a capacitor is exactly opposite to that of an inductor. So how do you think capacitors are going to combine based on those relationships? Opposite. So capacitors in series will combine like resistors in parallel and capacitors in parallel will combine like resistors in series. Do you want me to do the calculus that proves that? Or can you take it on faith since literally everything else has worked that same way? I've got the math. All right, so I'm just gonna write those two relationships down. All right, so this is everything that I expect you guys to understand with regards to how capacitors behave. Um, I do want to take a look at a couple of the homework problems, much like we did on Wednesday. We might go into a little bit more detail because there are a couple of problems here. Um, I'm just giving you fair warning. I like these homework problems, okay? What did I say earlier in the class when I pointed out homework problems that I liked. Expect, there's, expect to see something very similar on your exam, okay? So. So we're looking at homework set number 12 here. Let's look at problem one just real quick. So this is a fairly straightforward thing. Um, in fact, your in-class assignment problem number one is almost exactly this with just different numbers. So we'll address any questions that you guys might have about that here momentarily. And I'll talk to you guys about an easier way to do a couple of things as well. Um, and then this is an equivalent inductor relationship. So that's straightforward. And then we have combining capacitors, fairly straightforward since we understand the rules. And now we've got this guy. So let's take a look at this guy. We are told what our capacitor voltage is, and we are asked to figure out what our source voltage is. So I'm gonna draw this circuit, and we're gonna symbolically work our way through things here a little bit. So here is Vs of T. I believe we have an inductance up here. So I'm gonna call L. We have a capacitance over here, which I'm gonna call C. And VC of T is equal to something that we know, right? So VC of T is a known quantity. Vs of t is the unknown quantity that we're looking for. Does anybody have any thoughts on how we might approach something like this? <laughs> 
So what type of circuit is this? It's not an RC circuit because there's no Rs. It will be an LC circuit, but that's not what I mean. So on like the third day of class, we called circuits like this single loop circuits because all of the elements are connected in series. And when we were analyzing single loop circuits, we used Kirchhoff's voltage law. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right here, okay? So I am going to say, that we have some voltage drop over our inductor, like so. And using Kirchhoff's voltage law, I can say that Vs of t is simply going to be the sum of Vl of t plus Vc of t. Well, what is VL of T? What's the relationship that we learned for the voltage drop across an inductor? L D I D T. Since the same current will flow through the inductor and the capacitor, I'm gonna call my inductor current I see. What's the relationship for my inductor current in terms of my, excuse me, uh, my capacitor current in terms of my capacitor voltage? Right. Um, let me, let me back this out because I'm trying to remember if I should do a second derivative, right? Um, so D by DT of, yeah, so I should be having a second derivative here. Don't know why I wrote a fourth. That's very obviously an L. And there we go. So the quantity that we're looking for Vs of T is expressed purely in terms of things we know. We're given the value of L, we're given the value of C, and we're given the quantity Vc of T. At this point, it's just a little bit of calculus because we have to take the second derivative of some function and then we're good to go. The function that we are taking the derivative of is a sinusoid. So what's the derivative of cosine? Just so that we're clear here, I'm gonna do this over here. The derivative of cosine omega t is what? So what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. And then we have to apply the chain rule. So we're also going to have a factor of omega that comes out. So this is going to look like negative omega sine omega t. Right. Integrating cosine of omega t, because this is likely something that we're going to have to do at some point, is going to look like 1 over omega sine omega t. Am I supposed to have a negative sign there or not? I don't think I am. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I wrote relationships for the derivative and integral of exponential functions on the board the other day, just to refresh anybody in Zoom land who didn't get to see it. Because I know for a fact that you guys will be using these. 
e to the alpha t, excuse me, the derivative of e to the alpha t is alpha e to the alpha t, and the integral of e to the alpha t is one over alpha e to the alpha t plus. All right, so that's one of the two, I would argue, hard homework problems effectively taken care of. Anything seem wild or crazy about that? Uh, this is just a graph problem, much like you guys did with inductors, nothing particularly wild or crazy here. And then this problem is uh, the problem that I get the second most number of questions asked about. Uh, the first problem being that one from homework three with all the weird loops and all that kind of jazz when you guys are learning how to do KCO. I get 15 questions a quarter about that one. This guy is strong second place contender. Okay. So off the jump here, we can see that we have two capacitors connected in series which means we could replace them with a single equivalent capacitance using the rules that we have outlined in this class. So that would mean that we would have a voltage source in parallel with a capacitor, in parallel with an inductor, or a single node pair circuit because everything is connected in parallel. When we analyze single node pair circuits, we typically use Kirchhoff's current law, right? So, If I have some voltage Vs of T, in parallel with some capacitance C, in parallel with some inductance L, like so, let's see what pieces of information we're given. So we're given Vs of P, so I'm going to write that down. If I'm not mistaken, we're trying to solve for Is of T. Yep, and we are also given Is at zero. So let me see if this is explicitly written here. Okay, it is. Is of t is the current that's leaving the positive polarity terminal of our source. And because this is a single node pair circuit where everything is in parallel, I'm going to choose to use Kirchhoff's current law to solve this thing. So I'm going to call this current. I C of T. I'm going to call this current I L of T. And applying Kirchhoff's current law, I can then say that I S is equal to I C plus I. Okay. Since all of our elements are connected in parallel, it's fairly obvious that the voltage drop over everything is just Vs of T, right? So how can I write my capacitor current in terms of that known voltage? All right. And what about my inductor current? the integral relationship, absolutely right. So we've got a little bit of a problem here in as much as in order to apply the relationships that we have learned, we need to know how the inductor current behaved at T is equal to zero. Does anybody have any thoughts on how we might figure that out? Okay. 
pretty much. So Kirchhoff's current law has to be satisfied at all points in time, right? Kirchhoff's current law is the law of conservation of charge for circuits. So what Hannah is suggesting is that I C, or excuse me, uh, I S at zero has to be I C at zero plus I L at zero. Kirchhoff's current law to be satisfied. Well, I S at zero was given. I C at zero was not. And I L at zero is what we're trying to find. So, Let's do a little bit of reordering things. IL at zero is going to be IS at zero plus IC at zero. This is gonna be IS at zero plus CDV by DT evaluated at t is equal to zero. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. We're moving it to the other side. Yes, it should be minus. Thank you very much, Jackson. And there we go. Once we figure out what that IL at zero is, we plug it into IL t zero and that above equation, and then we're good to go. So I cannot, emphasize enough that nodal analysis and to a much greater extent mesh analysis should not be used as a crutch to do everything in this class um, because we are going to be relying on KCL, KVL relationships a lot as well. So it is very, very important that you guys understand the fundamentals and also understand how and when to apply them. So just to rehash things really quickly, anytime we see a single loop circuit where everything is connected in series, mesh and nodal are absolute overkill, Kirchhoff's voltage law is what we should be looking at. Anytime we have a single node pair circuit, mesh and nodal are absolute overkill, we should be applying Kirchhoff's current law. That's gonna get us the quantities that we want in the fastest possible way. All right, so now I think I am officially done ranting as I've explained how to do the two hard homework problems out of this set. I take that back. One last thing for your in-class assignment and also homework problem number one. Here. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, let me just open up this in-class assignment. And this is just to save you guys trouble. Let's see, this maybe. Yeah. Specifically part A of this guy. Um, one thing that I do wanna point out and I keep forgetting to change this, this should be W max because I'm asking you for energy, not P max, which would obviously be the maximum amount of power. So that's one thing from the jump that you guys always get confused about. Um, the energy stored in a capacitor is one half C times the voltage square, okay? So I'm asking you to find the maximum amount of energy that can be stored by the capacitor. And some of your gut reactions would be, well, we're gonna take the derivative of this guy and set it equal to zero. And there's nothing wrong with that, but mathematically, it's a huge pain in the butt, okay? Um, so I want us to think about things really quickly here, okay? We were trying to figure out what the maximum value of the energy is. Since one half is a constant and C is a constant, I would argue 
that the maximum amount of energy storage will occur when the quantity VC is either at its maximum value or its minimum value. And I'm saying that because there's a squared term there, right? If we were to plot VC as a function of time, it would look something like this because it's a cosine function. Right. I'm not going to bore you guys with trig identities to figure out exactly where that VC offset and things like that are going to be. We'll do that later in this class. Um, but we have a DC offset plus some cosine squared. So we're going to have some DC offset and then some oscillation around, right? So since our voltage never gets negative, I would argue that the maximum energy stored by the capacitor will occur when the voltage is at its maximum. Does anybody have any problem with that, right? If the amplitude of V is at its highest, then the amplitude of W should be at its highest. So let's break down our voltage waveform into parts to figure out what the maximum value is. So this is gonna sound kind of dumb, but what's the maximum value of five? It's five, right? Okay. Now let's look at this other bit. So what's the maximum value of a cosine function? One, right? Because cosine by definition ranges from positive one to negative one and cycles back and forth indefinitely. So if the maximum value of the cosine function is one, what do you think the maximum value of cosine squared is? Also one. So what do you think the maximum value of three cosine squared is? Three. So what's the maximum value of VC of T? Eight. There you go. You just figured out effectively what the answer to this question is without doing any of the genuinely awful calculus that this problem would suggest should be used. Just by thinking about how that voltage waveform is going to behave. Okay. So I can say inherently, that maximum value is going to be eight volts. And therefore the maximum amount of energy stored by a, our inductor is going to be one half times C times the quantity eight volts squared, whatever that comes out to be, which should be that. And you can do something very similar on your homework as well. 